Before jumping into the ibrutinib case study, I will first show you a few key features of the simulator. We have three key components to the SimSIP model, the population data, the drug data, and the trial design information. Starting with the population data, I have it set on healthy volunteers. As you may already know, drugs are typically first tested in healthy volunteers, so we use this population to predict the first in human dose for a new drug. Clearly, healthy volunteers are not representative of wider society, so we've developed populations that enable us to extrapolate to other patient groups, such as cancer patients and children. Each population is defined by a range of physiological factors that affect the exposure of drug in the body and consequently dose. For example, on the demographics tab, you can see that we define an age range, sex, weight and height for this population. We also consider genetic differences. These can play an important role in setting the right dose for each patient. Reminding you of the importance of SIP enzymes, we can evaluate how patients that are metabolized by these differently will react to the new drug. For example, in this healthy volunteer population, 8% are poor metabolizers of the CYP2D6 enzyme. For a drug metabolized by this enzyme, this results in higher drug levels in the body and the possible requirement for a lower dose. Now I'm going to take you through some of the submodels in SimSIP. These allow us to confidently predict how the drug will perform in key organs. Here in the liver model, we define the abundance of the different drug metabolizing enzymes. These are used together with in vitro lab data to determine the role the different enzymes play in the clearance of the drug. This helps define drug interaction risk factors. The gastrointestinal tract model is important as it allows us to predict the rate and extent of absorption of a drug. We can do this under fasted and fed conditions. As you may know, this can be important as when you get a drug from your doctor, you are sometimes asked to take it with or without food. Important parameters to define these potential differences include the gastric residence time, pH and bile salt concentration. Moving to the tissue composition tab. We don't just simulate the exposure of drug in the blood, but we also simulate drug concentrations in different organs of the body. This allows us to assess issues related to both efficacy and toxicity. Taking biopsies is an invasive procedure, so the concentration of drugs in human organs can really only be explored by a simulation. On this page, we show the water, lipid and protein content of different organs. Bringing in in vitro lab data, we can predict how a drug will partition into these different tissues. We also have highly complex mechanistic models for the skin, brain, lung and even for tumours. We can use the brain model to predict whether a drug will cross the blood-brain barrier and we can use the lung model to predict exposure of a drug in particular regions of the lung. And we have done this to support COVID therapies. Moving to pediatrics, we recognize that children need to take medications, but including them in clinical trials is challenging. Children are physiologically not just small adults, so you can't just scale the dose. SimSIP has developed a unique paediatric model um, that incorporates parameters related to organ growth and drug metabolizing enzyme expression. These enzymes are low in babies and take time to reach adult levels. These factors and others affect the amount of drug the baby is exposed to and consequently the dose requirements. 
Given that it is very difficult to perform clinical trials with not only young children, but with pregnant or lactating women, the impact of such modelling approaches can be really informative. To address how drugs will perform in each of these populations, we have also created a pregnancy and breast milk model. We can use these together with our paediatric model to explore the exposure of drug in the pregnant mother, the fetus, as well as drug concentrations that the, the baby may be exposed to, either via breast milk or via regular drug administration. The SimSip simulator has enabled us to move from the one-size-fits-all drug dose from years ago to stratifying populations by age and other demographic factors, to smaller patient groups such as the renally impaired, and ultimately to personalised dosing. We can simulate populations of virtual patients by accounting for the distribution of these different demographical physiological and genetic parameters for each population. We also consider the co-variations between these different parameters to simulate realistic populations of virtual patients. The SimSip engine, which is behind this interface, represents more than 20 years of data curation. The model has evolved over this time period with leading pharma companies academic institutions and global regulators. I've highlighted some of the key population inputs, but I've really only touched the surface. The SimSip engine behind this interface consists of thousands of differential equations and millions of lines of model code. This is why the SimSip simulator is so unique. The complexity is hidden behind this user interface. Now I will move on to the, the drug-specific data inputs and describe these in the context of ibrutinib. Remember the overall objective here is to integrate drug, population and trial data to predict outcomes in virtual populations. The input parameters for ibrutinib are used to characterise its absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion properties. We start by adding some basic in vitro data related to its physicochemical and binding properties. These together with information on solubility, permeability and metabolism allow us to predict how it is absorbed, distributed and metabolized. Looking more specifically at the absorption tab, ibrutinib is, it is administered as a tablet but we can also use this part of the simulator to refine the formulation of a drug, for example, moving from a tablet to a capsule. On the elimination tab, we input in vitro data relating to the metabolism of ibrutinib. These, these, these data help inform the drug interaction risks. Ibrutinib is mainly metabolized by CYP3A4, but other clearance mechanisms are involved, and these are described here as inputs. Our next goal is to simulate clinical trials for ibrutinib. Within the SimSip simulator, we can simulate as many trials and include as many virtual patients as we want, including looking at different age ranges or the percentage of males and females. We then select the route of administration, the dose, and whether we want to simulate a single dose or multiple doses. We then run the simulation by clicking the green arrow. In this case, SimSit will predict the exposure of ibrutinib in healthy volunteers after a single oral dose. The results are output into Excel. Firstly, I will show you some examples of the kind of things we get out. On the first page of the outputs, we have a summary of the trial design, the compound parameters, and the results. You can also view the demographic data 
and SIP enzyme levels for each virtual patient simulated. Now to the key results. Here you can see the predicted concentrations of ibutinib in the body with time on the x-axis and concentration on the y-axis. The simulated concentrations compare well to the observed data. On another sheet, you can visualize the predicted pharmacokinetic parameters and how they vary across the different tr simulated trials. Finally, you can also pick out particular virtual patients to help understand the extremes and risks. For example, virtual patient 9 has a higher exposure than some of the others. Looking back at the enzyme tab, this virtual patient has a low CYP3A4 level. We repeat this step to confirm that we can capture the observed ibrutinib exposure in other studies with other populations and dosing regimens. Then we predict scenarios that have not been studied. Recall that ibrutinib is metabolized by CYP3A4. We observed a large drug interaction with ketoconazole, a strong 3A4 inhibitor. But what happens with other CYP3A4 inhibitors? To explore this further, we can update the population to a cancer population and include an inhibitor model. In this case, we are using diltiazem as a moderate inhibitor drug. Diltiazem is one of more than 100 drug models we've created within the simulator. On the interaction tab, we describe the inhibitory potency of diltiazem against the CYP3A4 enzyme, along with its metabolite that also inhibits CYP3A4. Next, we set up the trial design. Here we add the dose and dosing regimen for ibutinib, but also for the co-medication diltiazem, and then we run the simulation. We can view the simulated exposure of ibrutinib in the body in the absence and presence of diltiazem. As you can see, the exposure is predicted to be about five to six times higher when co-administered with diltiazem. This represents a strong drug interaction. As our goal is to determine appropriate dosing recommendations for different patient groups, we can view the degree of interaction predicted across the different trials. This allows us to suggest alternative doses in the presence of diltiazem. The cadence is to select a population run the simulations to determine the drug interaction risk, and then we can do this with as many other drugs and populations as required. Moving beyond drug interactions, we can take this model and explore other scenarios. These may include looking at exposure in different populations, across different age groups, exploring sex differences, looking at different doses and dosing frequencies, and large versus small trials. The choices are endless. One SimSip simulator and many different submodels.